नहीं करते जी नहीं करते नहीं करते ठीक है जी ओके फोक्स आई थिंक इट्स अबाउट टाइम वी बिगेन वी गिवन पीपल कस्टमरी टू और थ्री मिनट टू ज्वाइन थैंक यू वेरी मच फोक्स वेलकम टू द पी आई डी वेबिन वी आर ऑन अ क्वेस्ट टू लर्न अबाउट द एनर्जी सेक्टर द फाइव पॉइंट फाइव ट्रिलियन लॉस दैट वीव हैड इन द लास्ट टेन एलेवन ईयर्स इट्स अ ह्यूज लॉस which is much larger than our education budget or many other budgets so we should be very careful on uh, when are we going to address this problem there are so many leakages in this economy how can we survive so this is the request for our knowledge so far what we've learned is we've had some excellent speakers and the round table is here too uh, we have today with us aisha ali from lums she's going to give us a view on how to develop the i mean basically today what you're going to discuss is how do we really move forward in this area we've talked about the loss we've talked about uh, the energy planning and investments what we've learned so far is that we are we've got an ex- extremely mismanaged sector where nobody is clear on what their rules are it's like playing cricket where everybody is doing this different things nobody is coordinating so to understand our prime minister's analogy all of us want to be wicket keepers bowlers batsmen at the same time and that's the kind of game that we are playing in the energy sector the planning is so bad that we are setting up projects left right and center so um with all kind of sometimes coal sometimes gas sometimes this we are not we learned last time many people told us that we need to make sure that all everybody is using electricity for example and that everything goes into electricity so the number of things that we are learning and we will inshallah keep codifying them today let's talk about how we can set up an energy market everybody talks about the electricity market how can we move forward so i think we've got three great speakers today and we've got a panel we've got aisha ali we've got ahmed durani we've got shahid sutar aisha ali is from lums ahmed durani has his own firm an entrepreneur plus a former world banker has worked in the energy sector for a while shahid sattar is a former member of the planning commission and has worked in the energy sector for a long time in many capacities at a round table as usual we've got armina malik we've got tahir bisharat chima we've got rashid aziz we've got wakar zakria wakas bin najib akhtar ali so i think the round table we've got many other people too so i'm expecting that we give the speakers a few minutes to speak first then we get to the round table after that we'll get to the audience so let's try and have as uh, informed a discussion our job is to stay ahead of the media we don't want to compete with the media we want to ensure that we have a very erudite very complex discussion on the system so that we understand it from a research perspective so with that let me move to aisha ali aisha please you have the floor okay um thank you nadeem saab and i uh, thank you to you and to pied uh, for organizing this uh, series and this round table and uh, this has been really useful and uh, you know we uh, are learning a lot from it and i hope today that uh, uh, you know we can uh, uh, you know discuss this take this further uh, along the directions that you have uh, indicated so without further ado what i'll do is that i'll uh, have some slides uh, which uh, um so okay so uh i guess someone is uh, already playing the slides or should i run yeah. them the slides are, i can see the slides uh okay uh, may, let me uh, run them on now. my own go ahead you That's do it that's fine okay i'll do it okay and um hmm. so just so i can just uh, move through at my own pace uh, so i hope people can see now we can and, see it hmm. okay great um hmm. so let's move ahead So today what I'll be talking about is uh, envisioning the future of electricity market in Pakistan. Uh, we are passing through really challenging times. There's a lot of uncertainty. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Please switch off your mics folks. Let Aisha speak. Go ahead Aisha. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we are passing through challenging times. There's a lot of uncertainty as to how this will progress. But let's see, you know, the what the status quo has been so far and and where we are right now. So, um, just to begin with, what uh, Pakistan's plan was uh, in terms of transitioning to competitive markets. Uh, so in 2015, uh, 
the first time that uh, this proposal was laid on the table uh, and it was approved by ECC uh, and they decided to introduce a competitive trading and bilateral contracts uh, market, which is basically a wholesale comp competitive market uh, for the electricity sector. Um, and uh, CPPA uh, was to act as the market operator. And what it would do is that it would basically uh, set up this market where buyers and sellers could trade electricity uh, both in real time and uh, through long-term contracts. And uh, NEPRA's job as usual would be to be the regulator to uh, oversee the competition in both the generation and the distribution end. Okay. Now it took a while before uh, this plan could even, you know, uh, there could be even any movement on this. And uh, it was only in 2018 where uh, CPPAG was tasked to develop the details of, of this model. Okay, and uh, then from then po that point onwards, there began a series of uh, stakeholder consultations, uh, which were led by NEPRA, and NEPRA was basically tasked uh, with obtaining consensus feedback from all the uh, potential uh, players who would be participating in this uh, market. Uh, finally, in December 2019, uh, the high-level plan, was which was proposed by CPPA, was approved. And uh, CPPA was further directed to produce a detailed implementation plan. Okay, so um, today what I'll do is that I'll not talk about the contours of that plan or the details of that plan. I believe there are other experts at the table who can talk more about that. But what I'll do, and I, I hope with this uh, introduction, we can begin to then discuss in more detail the contours of the plan or the features of the market, is to begin with a high level, big picture overview of how electricity markets can be organized. Uh, sort of like the canonical models and the canonical benefits, I'll uh, go over those. Uh, but not, you know, in, uh, I'll spend less time on that. And then I'll talk more about what needs to be done to realize the fruits of competition if we are to actually go ahead and at some stage be able to transition to competitive electricity markets, what would be required given the status quo that we have in the sector right now to actually uh, uh, realize the true fruits of competition in the electricity market, okay? So to begin with, uh, in any market, uh, we must first be clear about the desired goals. So the the you know usual kind of goals that people put forward uh, in, in favor of markets or competition are lower prices, right? So we would like uh, with competition, we are able to get prices as close to marginal cost as possible. Uh, in terms of output, we'd like that, you know, we can balance supply and demand. We can have more reliability uh, in terms of supply. We can have better quality supply uh, and all those features which uh, basically make consumers more satisfied with receiving the service. Uh, apart from that, there are going to be other goals which competitive markets are not necessarily going to achieve. Uh, one of those is access, okay, and uh, access in, in terms of both affordability, so how much does power cost, and also in terms of distribution, like who gets uh, what, and, uh, you know, are the underserved areas going to get access, are we going to be able to ensure universal access at affordable rates or not. So all those objectives are also important from uh, the perspective of, of uh, this country. Uh, Moreover, we also need to be cognizant that uh, there is a public good feature of this market, namely the transmission infrastructure, which if left to the competitive market on its own, we will not achieve optimal investment in that. So we need to be careful about that. And those will be additional goals which need, need uh, to be taken into account in terms of investment into future capacity enhancement in the transmission sector. And if you know, we went to the retail model into the distribution sector as well. Um, and finally, environmental externalities, which are not a topic of, of this uh, session, uh, but I believe they deserve a separate topic uh, or session on, on their own. And you know, those need to be also taken into account. And those would be uh, desired objectives that you know, we should aspire to or aim to uh, meet uh, through you know, the kind of regulations, the kind of structures we introduce in this sector. So moving forward, we know that uh, the traditional way in which electricity markets were organized were through vertical integration. There would be one company, so for example, like the old uh, VAPTA of old days or the KE Karachi Electric of, of uh, current times, which take care of all the three functions, the generation, the transmission, and the distribution. And basically, this is the model with the least amount of competition because there is a natural monopoly which is uh, serving the market. Uh, 
as we move forward, which is the current status uh, in most of Pakistan today, which is a single buyer model, where you've got multiple generation companies, uh, there's not a lot of competition amongst these because we have basically signed long-term contracts. Uh, but still, you know, we've allowed the private sector to participate and to enter you know, after uh, you know, some, some processes to enter this sector. Um, there are multiple distribution companies, but these companies are not competing with one another. They are basically monopolies in their own areas, okay, and they are regulated. So moving forward, what we want to uh, move towards is the wholesale market model, which is the plan uh, which um, CPPA <clears throat> is basically tasked to uh, develop, right? So let's explain quickly what this model is. Basically, you've got a situation where you've got multiple buyers, which are going to be the distribution companies, and they're participating in a wholesale market to buy electricity from generation companies, okay? And this market could be a spot market, you know, these, these trades could be occurring real time, or this market could be uh, run as a futures market as well, or these uh, buyers and sellers could contract uh, bilaterally and write uh, fairly long-term contracts. Okay? Now, all of these models are possible within the wholesale market, but the key feature is that we need to have an independent market operator, also called independent system operator, which you see here, you're supposed to run the market, either the spot market or the futures market. The contracts could take place uh, bilaterally and the market operator does not need to be involved here. Okay? So this is in a nutshell, you know, what the wholesale market basically achieves. And the idea is that, you know, in the spot market, you, uh, since there is competition between both the generation companies and the buyers who are the distribution companies, you should get lower prices. Okay, so that's like the theoretical idea. Now, see here, you know, at the end of the consumers, this market is still regulated because you've not uh, introduced competition between or amongst the generation companies at the consumer end. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. But so far, this is the model that, you know, we are uh, moving towards or we hope to move towards. And the discos will still uh, remain regulated through, uh, you know, the current uh, mechanism, which is basically uh, a cost-based uh, mechanism in which you will never looks at the cost of, of distribution and uh, determines the appropriate tariff that the disco should be charging, which is then, you know, uh, covered by the tariff differential subsidy according to whatever price the government notifies, okay? So um, in terms of, you know, what will happen if we are to transition uh, to this uh, model, uh, we know that since uh, part of the market is going to be not competitive, we, we still need regulation. In particular, the retail price will still need to be regulated and government needs to decide if we are most likely going to continue with the status quo with more powers for NEPRA perhaps uh, given the IMF uh, conditionalities. And uh, apart from that, we also need prices and rules for access to the common resource, which is the transmission network. Because remember, the transmission network is something which needs to be shared. Okay? So, so that's what will be uh, developed in the plan by CPPA and is already in some you know, different facets of that are being looked at. And then rules for financing investments in, in transmission investments, you know, where there are bottlenecks, where there are price fluctuations, you know, we need to direct investments towards those areas, but how are we going to finance those investments? Uh, you know, how are the different players going to contribute towards that? Those will need to be determined through regulation. And finally, this uh, the last point, which I'll talk more about in one of the examples where I talk about you know, different countries and experiences from there is um, oversight to prevent uh, non-competitive behavior in the market. Because uh, even when we uh, liberalize the wholesale market, we allow multiple uh, generation companies, multiple distribution companies to uh, basically compete here, we must be uh, careful because there is still potential for non-competitive behavior because some of these are going to be able to get together, form cartels, or you know perhaps they are big enough on their own to uh, affect the market in different ways, okay? So uh, moving ahead then, um, the transitional is issues which uh, are being discussed right now are how to take care of the existing long-term contracts. So remember that you know, we've signed contracts with IPPs, the generation companies. How are we going to allocate these? What's going to happen if we are to move to a competitive wholesale market? Uh, we could directly assign them to the discos or we could have a transitionary phase in which we have um, a special body take care of these contracts until the discos are ready to take those over. So all those details need to be discussed in, in the plan. 
Um, and uh, two last points related to the transition, which is basically the capacity uh, of the market operator and the capacity of the mar market participants, because this market, market is going to be fairly complex. It's going to require uh, capacity on various various fronts, both operational capacity to basically organize and run this market, uh, for for these participants to have legal capacity to participate, to write contracts, etc., to have financial capacity, um, and to have the appropriate uh, human resource expertise. All all of those things will need to be taken care of. Okay. Um, so then um, finally, the fourth way in which we could organize uh, the electricity market, which would introduce the greatest amount of competition is if we were to go for the retail market model. Okay? Now countries have not traditionally jumped directly from you know, one to four or two to four. They've always sort of like you know, first set up the wholesale market and then transition to four because uh, four is essentially wholesale markets plus uh, retailer competition. Okay, so you cannot have the retailer competition until you have a well-functioning uh, wholesale market. Now, what happens in retailer competition, you basically uh, unbundle uh, the two services which the discos are providing. Okay, now you can think of there being two things which the discos uh, give to the consumers in terms of uh, power delivery. One is the infrastructure or the lines over which uh, the power is delivered. And the second is the power itself, okay? Retailer competition can only be achieved if you unbundle these two aspects and you basically have a stripped down version of the disco, which is the line company, a company which just manages the lines similar to the transmission infrastructure. Uh, and then you have multiple providers. Uh, these are called retailers or market companies or whatever you call them. Uh, these are going to be competing with one another to get customers. Okay, so let's say in Lahore, I would have the option of you know two, three different companies I could choose from uh, where to buy my electricity from. Okay, now these market companies now they are competing in the wholesale market and they are interacting with the generation companies either in the spot market or writing contracts uh, to basically buy the power. Whereas the line company now is just reduced to uh, simply the delivery function of it, right? And since the line infrastructure is a public good and it doesn't make sense to have multiple companies running lines parallel to one another, the line part of it or the transmission distribution part of it will still need to be regulated. Can, we can have different kinds of regulation regimes, either the cost based regulation or a price cap uh, regulation regime. Okay, but hopefully, you know, the idea is that as uh, much uh, you know, power you can give to the consumers, as much choice as you can give them, the more the prices will be driven down. Okay? Now, uh, how do the benefits of competition arise in, in these different models? Okay? So first, um, let me break down the price or you know, what would be the price in this market into different components. Okay, so you've got the generation side, you've got the transmission side, and you've got the distribution side. Okay, now with the single buyer uh, or the wholesale market competition, uh, where you would expect pressure on prices to come down is in the generation uh, side. So the generation marginal cost as well as the generation company markups because these companies are now competing with one another to sell uh, power to the discos. Uh, if there was competition at the level of generation companies, we would expect uh, the generation prices and the markups to fall down. Okay? Uh, with the retailer competition, we would additionally see the disco margin or the you know, additional price which the distribution part of, of this business imposes on, on the consumers to also come down. Okay? And that would now be the market company markup or the retailer markup. You know, and that would uh, basically be uh, determined by the extent of competition in the retail market. So if there are a lot of players, if there are a lot of retailers, uh, they will try to keep the markups low and try to uh, basically uh, get as much market share as possible. So in, in other words, you know, economically, you would expect that the retailer, uh, retail market competition produces the lowest prices uh, followed by wholesale market and followed by single buyer. Uh, model. Okay, so this is you know what we would expect uh, theoretically. Secondly, we would also expect uh, better uh, planning due to price signals. What I talked about before, uh, when, with the wholesale market, uh, wherever you have high prices on the uh, grid, uh, that's where you see that you know the demand is high and supply is low. You would need to target investments 
uh, transmission investments as well as generation investments uh, towards those nodes, towards those areas. And you know, that's how you expect that uh, you are basically serving the market in a better, more efficient way. Okay. And finally, if, if you had retailer competition, you would have you know, more product variety, better service quality from the perspective of, of the consumers. Okay. And also I put here dynamic efficiency, which is more of a long-term thing. You know, if, if, if uh, we have a well-functioning competitive market, we basically see over time uh, costs of, of all the players should decline in the generation sector, transmission, as well as distribution sector. So those are the canonical benefits. I'm sure uh, everyone is already aware, but I think it just needs, it puts things into perspective. You know, what are we talking about? And what do we hope to achieve uh, with this uh, model? Now, what would prevent us from realizing the true fruits of competition as we you know, move towards at some point in, in the future towards uh, wholesale markets and, and you know, finally towards retailer competition, if, if we ever reach that. Um, the first pitfall, I think, and, and this is quite important because experience from other countries shows that you know, people uh, can easily underestimate this, but you know, this can be quite a, a, a problem, is that when we set up wholesale markets, and in, in particular the spot market, uh, prices are going to fluctuate. Okay? And there is potential for large players in the market to basically take actions to uh, influence the prices to their private benefit. So we have example from California, electricity crisis in 2000, Philippines in 2013. I'm sure we can find more examples if, if we look further, where um, producers engaged in cartel-like behavior and they manipulated wholesale prices by holding back supply during periods of high demand, such as summertime, okay, which basically led to uh, large fluctuations in prices in California, as much as 20 times increase in wholesale prices, and as well as shortages, you know, because plants were taken offline and you know they basically refused to sell power in the market. Okay. Um, also, you know, if you had a regulated retail sector and prices were capped this would basically cause very large losses uh, to the government because government comes in and bails out uh, the distribution companies who are forced to buy power at such high rates. So that's the experience of, uh, of uh, monopoly power from these two countries. Then um, monopoly power could also be exercised by state-owned companies. Uh, so in Turkey, you know, we uh, uh, hear stories often uh, of private companies complaining that state-owned companies are undercutting a market price. So you know, all of these kind of uncompetitive behaviors, uh, we need to be uh, aware of those and we need to have ways and, and rules. Asha, in can you, can basically... Asha, you've got another five minutes, okay? Yeah, I'm going to finish up very soon. Uh, in, in ways in which we can curb uh, non-competitive behavior. Uh, the second pitfall uh, of which can prevent us from realizing the true benefits of competition is if we don't pay enough attention to how uh, entry in the generation sector is going to take place or what are the rules governing entry or you know what kind of regime exists. Because if we can't bring down the cost of the generation mix, uh, we are not going to bring down uh, wholesale market prices, okay? Because you know the wholesale market price is going to fall only as much as the marginal cost of the generation companies. So we cannot attract competitive generation. Uh, you know we are not going to experience the fruits of of uh, competition in in wholesale markets. In other words, we're not going to experience falling uh, wholesale market prices. Uh, and this basically requires uh, you know us to think not just in short term you know towards options like coal etc but you know longer term where we are uh, pricing or taking into account the full costs uh, which a diff different types of generation mix is going to impose uh, on this sector uh, thirdly uh, the distribution sector Okay, because you know we cannot expect that um, as soon as we transition to wholesale market competition, you know everything is fine, because we still got a very uh, troubled distribution sector where distribution companies are incurring large losses. They have very high average cost uh, of, of delivery due to um, different reasons, theft, mismanagement, etc. So you you cannot expect the prices to fall for consumers unless you bring down the uh, cost of the distribution companies. And if we don't do that, we are, and if we stay with the regime where we have controlled retail prices, we will forever be in a culture where we have to do these bailouts. 
and we have to basically support these dis distribution companies um, and you know we cannot uh, deliver electricity uh, competitively to consumers so that has to happen uh, for the true benefits of uh, the uh, even the wholesale model to be realized okay uh, and finally, and this is a point you know, which uh, I think you know, many of us tend to uh, you know, sort of like not connect with, with uh, the entire market as, as it is, but this is something which re is related to the governance uh, of this sector. You know, we keep on treating electricity as a political commodity. Um, and, you know, people uh, now, you know, there's a lot of research, and this is not just for Pakistan, this is true for many other developing nations as well, where electricity is perceived as a right. Okay, so consumers perceive it as a right, and politicians, you know, hand it out uh, for political patronage. You know, not necessarily physically hand it out, but obviously through manipulation of prices, through manipulation of, of uh, policy regimes, etc. They retain control over this sector. Okay, and, and until you know, we think about ways in which we can uh, sort of address this problem, we cannot have com competitive uh, electricity markets. So as, as soon as you, th you fall into this trap where electricity is perceived as a right and it's handed out as a political commodity, people are not willing to pay for it. And that is the underlying cause of theft uh, or non-repayment in, in, in this sector, right? Which makes distribution or provision loss making, which then in turn leads these companies to have unreliable supply, to have poor service, to have bad infrastructure, and gets us stuck in this kind of vicious equilibrium, you know, where we are unable to deliver good quality service uh, at affordable uh, rates, where we are unable to achieve the objectives which I stated at the beginning uh, in this sector. So to conclude my final thought to summarize uh, this, this uh, round table, for the first part of, of of my uh, uh, contribution uh, is to basically, you know, highlight or emphasize that, you know, yes, competitive markets uh, hold a lot of promise, but unless we address the underlying structural issues, we cannot reap the benefits of competition. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you very much. That is a very good presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, let's go to Shahid Sattar. Shahid Sab, um, you got 15 minutes, but let me just raise one quick question with you before you go on. Um, making a market, I mean, I don't know energy markets, but I know other markets. Making a market is a very complex task. And markets really require healthy individuals to trade with each other. Unfortunately, do we have healthy individuals in the electricity market that can that can compete for a price or are we going to have unhealthy people trade with each other what you've discovered is that if unhealthy people trade with each, each other it's like the covid infected patients meeting each other it'll destroy the market shad sab 15 minutes go ahead okay first of all i'd like to answer your question and that question is that uh, where even an iota of competition is being introduced or business to business deals, i.e. healthy individuals interacting with each other on arm's length basis and market setting prices. That's not being permitted by uh, the established bureaucracy in the sector. So, uh, I mean, we have to step back and look at reality. Reality is that the political influence and the uh, capture of this sector is uh, so very uh, strong that any change is going to be resisted. So with that, I'd like to go on to okay. my presentation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I had just focused on um, wheeling uh, as an, a case study for studying how uh, our march towards liberalization and markets is uh, progressing. But uh, uh, last night I was told that uh, I should cover the entire sector. So I've just put together something high level. Um, and uh, uh, basically, Ma Ma Maisha has covered the market structures. But uh, let me just give you some high level uh, background on this. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
the deregulation of electricity from monopoly to competitive structure started in the 80s and we are all aware of uh, what happened and how uh, you know ultimately it led to the ctbcm uh, which is the uh, uh, structure that the government has come up with as a market structures that they would be comfortable with uh then next slide please um i'd like to bring something else to the table which is that uh, over you know technology advancements all over the world have led to uh great reduction in prices in all types of things yet electricity prices in pakistan especially rather than decreasing have increased and especially the grid provided electricity uh, so obviously there is something wrong with the model however uh, this fact uh, that the prices have reduced uh, next slide please can also be seen that the distributed uh, energy i e the self generation uh, and the newer technologies their prices have dropped tremendously and uh, by uh, over time and this is as a result of the technological advances and so forth so um, and i mean sticking to the old uh, concepts and the old supply situations and so on uh, is not going to be healthy for pakistan or even affordable for pakistan next slide please uh electricity markets in other countries uh have followed a path a path of the same path that we have tread so far but at a much faster pace uh they've unbundled generation transmission and distribution they've established an independent regulator and then they have created markets under very different models uh but the basic concept in all of these is uh to create competition and to create competitive tension which is what drives the prices down uh because if you do not have uh, the need to look for cheaper sources uh you won't do so next please the electricity markets in other countries have had uh these uh, goals which is security of supply efficiency improvements appropriate energy prices uh and uh, progressive decarbonization and relief of treasury from any sovereign guarantees and so on which is the big big driver in pakistan's case next please uh the basically the electricity markets are basically competition for the market which is basically the single buyer uh, i mean uh, which is the model that we are still pursuing uh, which is uh, the generation has been outsourced again but this is we are not uh, gone down fully in this side because we have long term contracts uh, backed by sovereign guarantees uh to pay certain prices and uh, so there is no competition in the supply side and there's no competition in the market which is i e that uh, as the right of either a bulk consumer or even a retail consumer to buy from different sources next please the competitive pricing in energy uh, can you know uh basically is an auction um or some sort of uh, competition uh and this competition has reduced prices tremendously in other countries however given our current set uh demand supply situation i can't see any additional supply being brought in through competitive pricing in pakistan uh if you look at dubai 
uh, they started off at six cents per kilowatt hour in uh, uh, in solar, and the latest that they have is less than three uh, cents per kilowatt hour. So, and this is as a result of uh, competition. Uh, similarly, in other countries uh, like Brazil, Argentina, Russia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, prices have reduced very significantly. Then, next, please. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this because Mahesha has already explained the wholesale markets and retail. So if we could just turn the next two slides. Next, please. Yeah. The advantages are markets are allowed to find the lowest cost solution, but provided there is a market. There's reduced government interference and prices affect decisions about the purchase and usage of technology. Uh, then there are certain disadvantages, but those disadvantages are far outweighed by the advantages. Uh, next, please. Now, come down to a very specific case uh, of how change is viewed by the government or by the current mm -hmm. bureaucracy or the power sector. Uh, which is that uh, in the Wheeling, uh, the government published an SRO uh, in 2016, uh, which allowed Wheeling, i.e. Uh, third party access to uh, your uh, transmission and distribution systems and allowed uh, generators to seek their own customers, bulk power purchases, uh, who could buy from them uh, and uh, at cheaper rates than obviously than the government or the grid. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is basically uh, a first step in any market development and most countries have a lot of dealing. So, and this is uh, the World Bank, IMF have advised Pakistan to move towards a free market in uh, inverted commas because uh, it is now the IMF that is used uh, in all the arguments. Shait Saad, I think my, it might be a good idea if you told the audience what Wheeling is, because I certainly don't know what it is. Gee, wheeling is uh, that a, a generator sets up a generating unit, and then mm -hmm. he finds his own bulk consumers, A, B, C, D, uh, situated mm -hmm. all over the country. And then he pays a certain charge on um, for transmission and distribution, and he is allowed to sell to those companies at his directly contracted prices, uh, which is basically giving a choice to the bulk power purchaser to buy from the grid or from an independent generator. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, this is a test case as to are we ready or is the government are going to allow any move towards market? Hmm. Uh, next case, please. The, uh, given that SRO, there, were, uh, there are two particular cases that uh, happened as a result, uh, which applied for the wheeling license and which applied for selling this electricity. One was with the Fatma fertilizer, uh, and the other was Pehor, which is a, a, a hydro project in the north. And they, uh, the provincial government uh, is selling electricity directly to its industrial consumers from that uh, station. Uh, Pehar has, because it's a provincial government and uh, it is uh, based, they have been allowed and they are now selling the electricity at roughly nine rupees per kilowatt hour uh, to industrial units situated in some of their industrial areas. However, Fatma Group uh, mm. has not been so far allowed uh, to operate the, this thing. And uh, CPPA and the discos challenged the wheeling regulations and said that uh, these are uh, uh, these are issues with the wheeling charges. 
and without addressing these they will not allow the use of their system for selling electricity to bulk power purchasers and these next page please uh, these fixed charges and cross subsidies that they were talking about are more than 11 rupees per kilowatt hour for a b3 consumer this is last year tariffs and they'll be higher now and uh, given that if you add these charges on to the wheeling cost and the generating cost of the current generate of the new generators it just cannot compete with the grid and uh, given that these charges uh, are now a reality in a sense that uh, the government has incurred and they are standard costs and uh, so someone somewhere has to take a decision on how to address them but surely burdening your industrial sector or your billing uh, so what are uh, what are the css and variable fixed can you quickly explain these please cross subsidy uh, okay. which is cross subsidy. Cross subsidy, which is uh, the, what is charged to the uh, b3 consumers but which is not directly a cost mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the cross subsidy that's uh, taken out of their tariff and given to the residential consumers or whatever. Okay. And then the fixed charges are the capacity purchase price and the use of system charges and and so on. The variable charges only form a small part of the whole tariff. Mm. Uh, next page, please. Mm. The Ministry of Energy uh, is not allowing. nationwide wheeling of power to bpcs for which the uh, legal regime has been in place till since 2016 uh, and this has also been uh, you know further reinforced by nepra uh, and they have uh, separated the network business from the supply business uh, and uh, the separation of the network and the supply side allows for competition at the distribution level uh, however even at the wholesale level you're not having competition so i don't know how this is going to uh, proceed further um, and if uh, you are not going to take the first step towards liberalization of the market how can you take anything beyond that uh, so what we are discussing at the moment is purely academic in my view as uh, the uh, because nepra decided that uh, the challenge that the cppa and the government had on the wheeling charges was not correct so they decided in favor of the wheeling uh, regulations so what uh, uh, the ministry of power has done is that it has Uh, I moved an amendment to the NEPRA Act. This amendment says that you have to pay the fixed charges as well as the cross subsidy charges, and that you cannot leave the system for three years, okay. and if you dis, uh, without giving notice. So, and if you leave the system, you still have to keep paying those charges. Uh, that's one part of it. Then the federal government has also taken upon itself. to charge any mm -hmm. consumer additional charges to cover for these charges uh, or any other charges that they deem fit so basically the the nepra act amendment in my view negates any uh, okay. role of the regulator mm -hmm. next slide please uh the no previous slide yeah previous slide please previous yeah no no uh previous to that one more one more yeah uh bilateral contracts is the first step um uh, and for this uh again uh, this is just an explanation of what i have already stated so we move on uh and if we go to the next slide we see that uh, the nepra act already states that tariffs should allow licensees the recovery of any and all costs prudently incurred 
uh, surely uh, the if you look at last slide only the prudently incurred elements of any entity's cost should be passed on to other entities or consumers specifically inefficiencies arising from poor performance or the government's own priorities should not be considered when determining prudently incurred costs uh, next please Uh, this is again implications of imposing additional wheeling costs, which is that uh, the basically you would be the entire market as such would be still born. There would that we can't move towards a market if you're not allowing even the first step to be taken. Next slide, please. That's up three minutes. Yeah, just finishing. Um, one of the key challenges to the economy is that the balance of payment situation of Pakistan has always been very tight, and the current account deficit is being financed by external borrowings. This cannot continue indefinitely and has to be at some point met through increased exports. And increasing exports means that you have to have competitively priced products to sell. And in order to have competitively priced products, you really need one of the key inputs, which is energy to be priced competitively. Energy to be priced competitively can only happen if uh, some choice is available to the uh, bulk consumers or exporters to buy from any sources that they uh, find are cheaper. And by denying them these uh, choices or the freedom of buying from uh, third parties, the effectively the government is also killing any move towards a more sustainable balance of payment. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Shahid Sab. Thank you, um, Ahmed Durani Sab. Now, see, I call you Sahab. So, Ahmed Durani Sab, can you please take 15 minutes to tell us, since you are from the World Bank, partly the World Bank is responsible for this. How do we how do we create this market for the future? How do we move, move into 2020 from 1995? You have Thank 15 you minutes. Much. Okay, I shall try and stick to time. I'm going to try and share my screen very quickly. So kindly let me know when you see my screen. Can you see my we screen? Do. We can see it. Go ahead. Okay, super. So let me just go there. Okay. Okay, just the last check. So it's visible, right? To everybody? Visible. Thank you. Okay, Nadeem Sam, so uh, if you allow me, let me start by saying that, you know, when I was asked to do this day before yesterday, I actually wanted to uh, spend more time preparing for this because what I think the things you had asked for us to do are basically look at what are the necessary reforms. And I think everything is in the context of modern electricity markets. So I'm not you know, my, I really did not want to talk about what's happened. I wanted to talk about what if, some, you know, something else could happen. And you asked a question about, does this new market, will regulatory systems be required? You asked about pricing, how that will be said, and you also asked about government guarantees. Now, let, let me first say that, you know, I have to qualify my presentation today by actually saying that I, I live by the mantra that to live again, one must first die. I'm quoting a, a person who is not quotable, but this is Salman Rushdie out of Satanic Verses, but I think it's a very touching quote, the only thing good about the book. So let me also say that there are, with the existing system, I think we already know that this existing the system cannot be abandoned, but also needs to be modernized. So something has to be done. And I think on that, we already had a discussion last time. I think again, uh, both Aisha and Shahid have also given ideas about what needs to be done. I think some of which is being done by the government, but some of it is not being done by the government. And I think one of the key things, and I think you will see in my presentation is this whole NEPRA's new rules about fixed charges and cannot leave and paying the wheeling charges. I mean, this is going to kill the future. And part of it is because uh, I think as we move to the models that Aisha talked about and Shai talked about, which is consumer choice through open competition, even for base load, one of the key things you need to realize is base load globally in all the countries where things work fine is basically managed between the generators and the industry. 
Let me give you some quick statistics. Germany has uh, on paper 50 per 550% of its energy currently uh, generated through renewables. It has 800 individual providers, 800, okay? Uh, of which 40% are essentially what are labeled as community providers. But despite that, only four companies synthetically hold 73% of the power. Four transmission system operators work on an area-based concession. The residential prices are the second highest in Europe. The residential tariff, sorry, the, uh, the industrial tariff is 50% of the residential tariff. Please, that, that's very important to understand. But it's still 21%. Sir, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you please share your slides? जी मैं ये अभी तो अपना वो जुबानी बयान कर रहा हूँ ना फ्लाइट आपको नजर आ रही है मेरी थिंकिंग फॉरवर्ड आई थिंक एवरीवन कैन सी इट नहीं नाउ इट्स गॉन इट यूज्ड टू इट वाज देयर ओके लेट मी लेट मी स्क्रीन शेयर अगेन सो जस्ट वन सेकेंड सो लेट मी स्क्रीन शेयर अगेन एंड आई लेट मी डू दैट Can everyone see it now? Yep, it's there. Okay. Okay. So basically, you know, the, the the whole idea coming back. So I was taking Germany as an example of the most rapid rapid sort of evolution in the European markets, and something which I think we can follow quite easily. Uh, but I think the thing I wanted to leave is on two points: one made by Aisha and one made by 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 Shahid Saab, and obviously it was going to be made by a lot of people that you know the industry cannot pay for this price of power. Now, the, in the, the industrial cost flexibility in Germany, despite it being one of the best markets around in Europe, is 21% above all the EU 28. Uh, but at the same time, what is important to remember there is it's 50% of the cost for the residential. The other thing is the fact that despite being totally decentralized, four companies synthetically own 73% of the, of the transmission. Uh, that is because of the point that Aisha made about the line infrastructure. So I think on line infrastructure also, in, in like in any place, like in a port, you have the channel, uh, the, the pipe that you send. I mean, this is now in modern uh, science and, and, and it's known as common user infrastructure. So common user infrastructure can also be set out and be outsourced to produce common user infrastructure markets, which can either be area-based, meaning that let's say, you know, the F71 or uh, DHA is an area. So you can do area-based concessions or you can do uh, what are called line-based concessions or route-based concessions. And you can do this for busing, you can do this for electricity the same way. So I think that having said all that, I think industries need, I mean, the, what we need now is industries to step up and have a direct conversation with the GENCOs in Pakistan, along with, uh, you know, sort of how to wheel power better. But I think my, my presentation today on markets is going to be slightly different from the previous two. And it's going to be about the fact that it's not about surplus, rather about where the surplus is. So we're going to talk about this both from a rural and urban point of view, because I really do believe that no single broad brush, of, brush approach will work for Pakistan. And I think a part of it uh, has to do with uh, connecting, you know, really the grid as we know it, the way we think about it, the way we keep planning, the way we talk is really an archaic instrument. And Yes, it is needed. A modernized version of it is needed to contain especially dense urban areas because it still is the best way to provide electricity there. But let me look at what else. So this is a South Africa, you know, as I mentioned in my last thing, that South Africa is having three times the problems we are. And basically the study there tells us that if everything works well, it'll take nine years to connect to the grid. A household will cost about 1,500 US dollars to connect. 15 billion US, US dollars if this investment is done in one go, a quarter century of more, uh, and if not tripled cost, if everything was to be done. So the numbers similarly for Pakistan are disastrous. And they are disastrous because of the general knowledge now that barring, barring uh, the dense industrial clusters, barring dense urban high-rise cities, which Pakistan lacks to, to a great degree, the grid domain is really not the best provider for affordable electricity. And uh, since I have less time, but this is not me, this is in the world has recognized this. And you know, even in the 2012, or sorry, 2011 uh, IEA report, this was recognized in Bloomberg also in the same year 
estimated these uh, distributed markets to be worth 64 billion uh, on their own. And these distributed markets, I, I mean, I want to spend one minute on this because it's not how we think. It's got many, many mummy moving parts. So it's not just that you do suddenly uh, cut off from the rest of the world and you start generating where you want, what you want, when you want, uh, and then you'll survive. No, that's not how it is because there's a role for storage to be played. Storage can have multiple uh, types of storage. You can have water-based storage. You can have uh, real battery storage, which daily, by the way, even is experimenting with right now. Uh, so basically, the thing is that when we talk distributed generation, it's about increasing the efficiency of supply, but also the efficacy of generation and the supply. Um, what, why, why this is important for Pakistan? So, I mean, I'm going to give you some studies that we've conducted in the last three years very quickly. But out of the 1 billion missing energy globally, 135 of them are in, in, uh, in Asia, of which about 80 million roughly are in Pakistan. Uh, the figures from various 55 to 70 million Pakistanis not connected, 75 million uh, Pakistanis are on the urban and rural grid, face more than 12 hours. So really the underserved is about 150 million Pakistanis. So I find therefore for the reasons uh, other than what Shahid stated, this whole debate that we have uh, about, you know, oh, poor Pakistan, we don't have electricity is, is really not targeted properly because really the time is to explore new markets and let these markets do things and which could also be actually extreme. We could go to an extreme tariff. Which would Amir, then be... uh, can you please also tell us what the what the term underserved means? Again, I don't understand this term. So, under, underserved, Am I underserved? Uh, well, let me explain underserved. Yes, you could be underserved if you are experiencing any, any load shedding uh, because you're supposed to get 24-7 supply, right? But underserved, we primarily define as those people that have more than half, uh, which means 12 mm -hmm. hours or more of uh, absence of electricity from the grid. So unserved means there is no grid. There is no distribution to your house, anything. So that's unserved. Underserved is, is the unserved plus those with more than 12 hours. So let me show you some results from Las Bella. So this is from a survey we did for IFC. Uh, this is about, about NK Electric. Essentially, they commissioned it. Um, average actually provision Las Bella towns is eight hours. So we are talking about Bela, Hub, Uthil, and Winder. And please remember that hub is actually quite the industrial center for, and the entire states of Karachi actually uh, are based there for, for, for their industry. Uh, so this is definitely what we call being underserved. What is really surprising, and I'm, I'm going to skip very fast because I think we need to get the questions and answers, but dissatisfaction is not just on the cost. Dissatisfaction is equal between quality and cost. Now, this is, you know, I'm talking of a survey in Las Bela. So we, we can assume that, you know, this represents, if not anything, the extremer sentiments. Even then, uh, its quality and cost are both a source of dissatisfaction for consumers. And people are willing to pay for quality electricity. This is what, you know, e even in, in, in a Las Bela, which I mean, I hope everyone can position geographically. Las Bela is right next to Sindh, and it's also K-Electric's domain. It's the district, but it's actually in Balochistan. And... Um, Really, now, if you look at this, this is essentially, in, um, a, you know, of all the industries in Bela, Habutal, and Winder, on the average, 70% are interested in an alternate source of electricity. This is, and again, industry in Las Bela, which is kind of the, the, you know, the hub of it all, is already saying that were we be allowed to, to be allowed, we would like to move to an independent source of electricity, and we will guarantee 100% offtake. This is coming from Las Bela Chamber of Commerce and Industry through some FGDs that were conducted. Um, so essentially, you know, and I'll be very, very conservative in this. This is a market sizing that was done by, by us three, three years ago. We're looking at about an 11,200 megawatt market, or in other words, the 33,000 gigawatt hours of national demand that is unmet. Now, this is unmet at current consumption. If you make turn this into the global consumption, if these people were to increase their consumption, we're looking at 130,000 gigawatt hours. This essentially translates to a market size of anywhere from 3.4 uh, billion per year, as in 2017, that could actually go up to 9 billion US dollars a year. So uh, when we look at it, you know, the problem with this is that when we start talking about this mar these markets, people say, well, hey, these markets are mostly rural. Uh, these people don't have money to pay. Uh, but, you know, let me just say this, the 10,400 megawatt CPEC plan does nothing for this market, nothing. 
Um, then we look at, you know, this whole normal of what people are criticizing. I mean, every policymaker that I've met from Sin Energy to Pedo to everybody says, well, I mean, you know, the reason we aren't taking grid there, we aren't supplying them electricity, even if the grid is there and they have meters, as in the case of Tata, uh, they say, well, you know, they don't have the money to pay. So why, why you know, we, we just can't supply. Now, this is really kind of a baffling because poor in Pakistan and your energy use when we do service, we break it down by, by usage. So is it for cooling, heating, lighting? What the hell are they using it for? And I'll mention a little bit more on the point source, single point source that uh, uh, Vakas mentioned in the last. So Pakistani poor, and this is a 2012 study, are spending 2.3 billion years on kerosene and candles alone. Now, you know, that's just the, the we can say, yeah, some of the kerosene could be for cooking. But, you know, so the market is able to pay if provision is done. That's the point. Another study we completed in 2018, uh, sorry, this was in 2016. Uh, this is for uh, looking at the levelized cost of electricity across Pakistan. You really see that, you know, uh, distributed generation has a competitive LCOE. And in fact, if, if, if allowed to, to, to develop as the world wants it and is trying to do it, we probably could install and deliver electricity much faster than waiting for some of the larger projects that we have in Pakistan, including transmission projects that have gone on and not yet delivered like Matiari 1 and Matiari 2. Uh, so uh, looking at, you know, distributed, what are, I, I just want to summarize for the audience some quick lessons because we did yet another study in 2019 paid for by, unbelievably, the Pakistan Poverty Fund and by the Rural Support Network because they were having problems scaling up their models of, of independent uh, distributed generation. So uh, key takeaways from you know, uh, the world global markets on distributed generation is that here are six things. One, you try flat subscription fees, you can do pay as you go. You can even run rent to own models. Um, there are things to watch out, which is decentralization, how you handle it. Uh, you I'm at three minutes, three yes, minutes. Sir. <laughs> and you're looking at, you know, basically government's role has to be minimized. And, you know, let's go now to the Pakistani. This is kind of a summary of the Pakistan here. Again, uh, we have to be very careful that we are doing nothing to really cater to this new uh, available energy market. Um, the thing on which the government has just taken $150 million from one of the development partners is actually for something which is the most expensive solution for, for poor. And um, as you can see, our numbers show that with just a 10% marker, solar financing home systems, which are being given to the poor for LED pedestals, are actually costing the poor 48 rupees per, K, per unit. Um, so I'm going to skip uh, essentially, but no, no, let's look at what will create these new markets. And I think one of the things is basically, uh, you know, the government really agreeing and understanding that no one NEPRA rule, no one way of doing business uh, will work for everybody. And I'm going to go to show you how. Uh, so we did basically uh, existing, uh, sort of plotting between existing models. And here where you see grid, uh, it means really the centralized grid models. And where you don't see the grid, so that will, so everything, so essentially what this showed us that for these unserved markets, and especially even for some of the urban uh, markets, and let me show you that on the slide, that we did some work with K-Electric in Liari near superhighways and also in the goats, where actually distributed generation starts making sense even for somebody like K-Electric. Uh, and so therefore this, what you see on the right top hand corner of this BCG, is essentially what we are talking about in terms of what are the best provision models, and they are mostly as you can see, some variant of distributed generation. Um, so what do we do? And let me quickly, the no single brush approach. I think that uh, the distributed generation, dense village clusters, we need to start thinking about them. Uh, there is some home for space for home solutions and we can actually, we need to give them central importance uh, because this also will kickstart um, the whole process of internal production of some of these products because while a centralized grid uh, electricity, most of the products we use there are mostly imported, a lot of what we need in DG can actually become an industry in Pakistan at scale. The other important thing is the sustainable electrification and economic development have high correlation. So we're basically looking at efficient capacity utilization. But the good news here is that the, the, if you look at the Aga Khan's review, uh, AKRSP review of Northern Pakistan, 
you find that of all new electricity created, almost 70% of it goes for uh, commercial usage. So it's quite the opposite of what the way current electricity suppliers are using electricity. Um, let me take you back. Yeah, so policy interventions. I think there is now a need uh, to really start talking about an off-grid or a distributed electrification policy based on learnings of some of these studies. And I think we need all these entities who are kind of running around like, uh, you know, uh, they have been 30 years doing this sort of microgrid. This I think they need to be aggregated under some chapeau to start understanding at least a technical exchange of ideas for more efficiency. And I think that uh, eventually, I think this is kind of the, uh, you know, just to give you an idea, uh, we need to start talking about this and this market, the, the distributed market then automatically by nature is uh, develop, it, it, will de de it will basically be based on renewables uh, because of the sheer nature of how they come around. And I think I will stop here. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think that's that's it. I mean, I was going to talk about mini grid pooling, but I think those market and that discussion I wanted to really discuss later on if somebody is interested okay. in how to set up these new markets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir Saab. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Look, the key takeaway that I get, and I'll turn to the table now. So anybody from the table, please raise your hand. Um, the key takeaway that I get is that it's a very, very complex issue. Uh, like everything else, it's a very complex issue. And uh, I'm afraid that people who say we know it all, all the solutions that they just implement them, I'm afraid they're the stupidest people in the world. Because quite frankly, there is very little uh, that we know. As far as I can see, I've seen Aisha Ali describing very complex market structures that will not be created overnight, that will take a long, long time to create a very deft handling, very serious professional to manage the market. Making a market is extremely, extremely difficult. It's not easy. And she's talked about the choices there. As far as Shastar goes, we can't even do wheeling yet. We haven't even got around to configuring who the agents or the players are in the market. So how will we do that? Then comes the distributed grid, which even gets more complex. So there are huge complex issues. I don't know who's thinking about it. So the people who say that we know all the solutions and there's no need for research really need to rethink their strategy. One of the reasons we are failing is because we have no research. So who does energy research in this country? QG, anybody from the round table? Uh, anybody wants to talk? Chima Saab, Armina, maybe anybody? First, I want to go to the round table. Akhtar Ali Saab, anybody wants to talk? Who is doing energy research in the country? Does anybody do any energy research in the country? Can you guys tell me that? Chima Saab has his hand up. I think we should- Chima Saab, bole Chima Saab. Well, thank you very much. Uh, after the stupendous presentations, hmm. let me contain myself to the subject please, and please. give an overview of what is happening in the discourse. Sure. Presently, in the power sector, minus K electric has become a nearly two trillion industry. The total revenues, which are calculated for all the discourse in Pakistan, all the 10, is nearly two trillion rupees. And we'll just discuss what exactly in this kitty of two trillion belongs to the discourse. Mm -hmm. Basically, they get the return on investment. If at all, they have made some investment. They get the depreciation on the assets. And lastly, they get the distribution margin. And maybe if they're efficient enough, they may make some profit. Now, this amount, all these four heads, just equal anything between 11 to 14 percent of the total value of the sector, two trillion. That means what? The maximum like is 300 billion rupees out of the two trillion, but they actually are running the system now. They're the ones who make NEPRA stop things. They're the ones who ensure that the power divin actually supports them and does not allow any change in the system. One. Secondly, now on the other hand, it is very important to understand what are the basic ingredients for a power market. Basically, it's presence of a huge number of sellers and even more number of buyers. 
in Pakistan, we actually do not have many buyers. The example of uh, Fatma group was just given by Shahid Star. They tried their best. They could not really find buyers other than those who were already part of that group. It's a very dip difficult proposition. And then there are no sellers. In Pakistan, the, the best seller that could come in the market has been the Fatma groups. 90 megawatt power plant at uh, Kotadu. And we have uh, another three sellers, basically, who were part of the erstwhile rental power program. And then there, there is industry which wish, wish, wishes to sell anything between one to 10 megawatts, nothing more than that. Then we need that it should, there should be a minimal concentration of generation complexes in Pakistan. Pakistan has been trying its best to create bigger complexes. Now, if we talk about coal, the best is 1,362 megawatts. Similarly, our LNG plants have been plus 1,250 megawatts. And the earlier behemoths or complexes in Guddu, Jamshoro, Muzaffargad, government owned, of course, they are plus 1,000, nothing short of that. So that is another issue. So the existing generation facilities have somehow to be broken down into small entities, other, otherwise the things will not move. But the fourth thing, gentlemen and ladies, is that the power sector has to be financially viable first. If it is making losses, if people are not paying, or if people are stealing, and the total revenue, if uh, it is thought to be 2 trillion and you just collect, say, 1.7, there's a shortfall of 300 billion. This will not allow any market to move forward. So what happens is we have to assure that the discos restrict themselves to their max 300 billion, not worry about the rest. One, collect everything of it the whole true trillion, I'm sure. And then they must understand that they can earn even more if they enter really into the wire business. Because for that, they are going to maintain their wires, assure that there are no interruptions, and assure that the B2B or uh, you know seller and buyers work together and move forward. So the first of the steps which need to be taken, which was also emphasized by my friend Shai Sattar, is wheeling. Wheeling is the first step. It is the first scope, the, the spoke in the wheel, which will make it turn. Otherwise, nothing is going to move forward. So there is a requirement for NEPRA to understand that the discos and the NTDC and the generators have to restrict themselves to their own part of the revenue. They have to assure that they collect everything and then not worry as to who wishes to buy from the discos or from some other generator. And once it becomes financially viable, once we create more generators, then uh, than uh, what we have at present. And there's another thing I would like to say, that, that NEPRA only allows generators who arrange for new equipment because they have to then enter into 30-year or 25-year long PPAs. For that, I understand it is very important. But, you know, when Wildcat or independent generators arrive, small plants, 25 megawatts, 50 megawatts, 100 megawatts, then this condition of new equipment must, must also go. Once that goes, the generation cost is going to come down to maybe 60% of what we have at present. And it is the economics which will allow the market to move first. But the first thing which we need to assure, of course, is that wheeling takes place. And for it, for it, the power domain has to understand, the government of Pakistan has to understand this thing. NEPRA has to change its spots. The discos have to be made to understand that they should not worry about 
revenues which are not theirs they must restrict themselves to the distribution margin the return on investment the depreciation and if they work very well of course they can get some profits and then allow allow everybody to work but wheeling will all will only work if we have balancing which is of course there in the books at the same time there is another concept of banking that too is needing needed otherwise wheeling will also fail so these are the things which need to be kept what in does mind. banking mean ji what does banking mean what happens is that balancing is that if the generator sends like 100 megawatts and it does not reach and only 97 reach then that 3 megawatt is filled in by the system operator so that 100 megawatts reach over there in banking what happens is each plant is going to shut down anything between 30 to maybe 50 days each year for makeover or overhauls so during that time the bank will operate meaning thereby that uh, the generator had the capacity of 122 megawatt 120 megawatts the generator was selling 100 megawatts each day and was banking 20 megawatts with the system operator and during those times when it is on the makeover or overhaul he is going to his his customer is going to get supply out of that bank these are very important things both balancing and banking thank you very much more complexity introduced banking and balancing so it requires a really clever operator to operate the market so we really need to know some somebody rashid sir do you want to say anything sure yeah i'd like to <clears throat> make a few remarks one of uh, to start with uh, aisha's presentation and shahid's presentation amir's presentation jima saab's comments very relevant very knowledgeable very uh, appreciated mm. defining both what should be done or needs to be done the the quote and quote expectations and to a certain extent the actuals but i do want to point out we are missing one very important part of it the entity responsible for developing the market and whose efforts we should appreciate is somehow not interested in participating so i i understand why it had invited cppag they have maybe made an irrelevant excuse or maybe made a very relevant excuse and not attended or not joined mm -hmm. the difference between the trans uh, the this entire group therefore is not understanding how much of the what should be done which were the earlier three presentations and how what is being done which should be demonstrated to us by cppag how much of that balance is emerging we we unfortunately have the what should be side we don't have enough of the what is side i would like to say they are doing tremendous amounts of work they are following after a lot of research on south american markets european markets southeast asian the turkey experience etc they have selected a particular model partly this might be answering your question who's researching so cppa has done tremendous amounts of research on the question of how to establish a market and which market model would be most appropriate for pakistan so nadim that's just on one aspect yes they have done a lot of research they have agreed to and uh, selected one particular model they've gone to the regulator gotten the in principle approval they're doing the detailed nitty gritties etc etc uh, so there is a bit of work ongoing plenty needed to be done etc but a market could emerge but the second point which i want to in a way blame cppa for is shahid's point the fact that their model is competitive trading bilateral contracts model c t b c m bilateral contracts is a part of the name not just a key objective meaning a purchaser like a large uh, industry a large hotel building a large uh, commercial complex wanting to purchase from a generator and pay the intermediary charges the wheeling charges 
the name includes it but they're doing all they can to prevent it unfortunately this is a case of <laughs> stating an intent and then temporarily doing something exactly the opposite so the model is a good idea is a is a has a, is actually working etc it's initial let's say the very first starting point bilateral contracts at least allow the few large consumers and large generators to be able to enter into contracts with each other and make it feasible and viable the second part is not being done lots of charges are being thrown on it etc etc partly driven by the ministry of energy and the ministry of finance not wanting to cater to a burden of the power sector on the they are imposing those charges on the existing consumer base largely on uh, bulk consumers and that's making bilateral contracts unfeasible or uneconomic that's one of the hurdles in its favor uh, in its implementation but the second one which i would equally want to say there is a gap between the regulator and the company the regulator should be saying develop a bidding process for long term contracts or long term new generation for example the competition for the market develop a bidding process and we will scrutinize one of it or don't develop it we'll do it two years from now whatever it is a bidding process announce a bidding process the regulator should say announce a bidding process etc etc all those things are prerequisites to introducing competition for the market new generators can come in on a bid and competitively determined price but unless a bid bidding process is announced whether it's for one year or one go or 1000 megawatts or 2000 megawatts two years from now five years from now whenever it is unless a process is launched 0% of contracts will be on competitively bid prices similarly when nepra said to cppa develop the model they also should be very clear will we approve the results of a bidding round will we evaluate or will we set a set of rules and anything according to that automatically carries nepra's approval so the tariff determined by a bidding round carried out by cppa say 2 years from now etc would that have to go through the 6 month rigmar role of a nepra tariff petition and a hearing etc or it would stand automatically those types of two or three procedural questions are lacking good, good point and if they're not addressed we <clears throat> will have problem of we'll only have negotiated contracts we'll have contracts with government guaranteed uh, sales and prices and we will have this inability to bring in some competition i'm not a fan of saying the ipp contracts with long term uh, uh, commitments etc etc should be renegotiated that will get us into the karke incident the recotech incident where international courts have determined pakistan violated that's the contract that's a separate issue leave that aside that's a separate so issue so i would so just just two we'll sentences we'll take that up later we'll take that up later no, no. no i i i'm i'm just coming to this point incremental power when it comes on bid prices as opposed to negotiated prices will gradually whittle away gradually over 15 20 30 years whittle away these long term contracts trying to undo or say we can't do anything because we have so many contracts doesn't get us anywhere okay thanks thank you dekhi ji i have not worked in energy markets but i have set up government bond markets i have worked in the stock market we set up government bond markets from scratch and one of the things that you do when you set up a government bond market is that you ensure who's sitting at the table and people who sit at the table must be healthy you can't have unhealthy people fix um, uh, sitting in a market with healthy people this is the problem of the american health insurance industry that they had to have individual mandates they had to have every healthy person in the market otherwise healthy people leave and leave the unhealthy people in the market so first of all we have to have health, healthy agents 
Unfortunately, in the market, there are no healthy agents. When there are no healthy agents, people are bleeding. Obviously, the good people can't be allowed to leave. This is the problem with the Shait Sattar problem, a wheeling problem, that we Lepra obviously can't let the healthy people leave. If the healthy people leave, then the unhealthy market goes further into the red. So there is a problem. Second thing that you need is you need a clearly defined contract you, so that somebody, for example, in the government ma bond market, you can buy only... 1 billion rupees of bonds. You can't buy less than that. You can't buy one bond, two bond, three bond. So you have to have a definition of a contract, whatever the contract is. 100 megawatts, five megawatts, whatever, but you have to have a definition. Third thing you have to have is settlement, which is where the banking and uh, balancing comes in. The fourth thing is that, that's, that you have to have clearing. Somebody has to pay the money and somebody has to receive it. Otherwise, the health of the market goes down. We've seen this again and again in the country. The fourth thing that you have to do is you have to have the SECP, which is regulating, and you have the stock market, which is purely operating outside the SECP. SECP is not regulating and creating the market. Unfortunately, I don't see that here at all. So if we don't have that, how can we have a market? Unfortunately, uh, what you've told me about the CPA, CB, CPBCM sounds very nice, but there is no clarity on the contract, on the rules of exchange, on who's sitting at a table. We used to take great care in defining who sat at the table. Everybody couldn't sit at the table. They had to post a certain bond. They had to have a certain financial health. Central bank would audit them, and then they could sit at the table. They couldn't sit at the table with losses on their books. They couldn't sit at the table with healthy balance sheets. Anyway, I want to bring in somebody else. Armina Bibi, would you like to say anything? Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, yeah. Dynamics of the bond market because there are parallels that we can draw with uh, the electricity market as well. And since CPBG is not here today, I think I'll play the devil's advocate and represent them a little bit here. Um, I would just like to point out that the CPBG over the past two or three years has put in extensive amounts of work into the processes you just described. And so they have outlines of contracts. They have rules pertaining to who can participate, how they can participate, et cetera. So the nuts and bolts of the system, um, at least a draft has already been put in place. And right now they're working on refining the model with uh, feedback from NEPRA and others. Um, so the issue is not so much that there's no architect uh, for the overall plan. There is in fact somebody who's leading the charge in that regard. But the problems that are going to arise will be more so out of the transition or the transformation of the existing entities into their new role. So for, uh, for instance, we don't have an independent system operator right now. That's a role that NTDC plays together with its transmission uh, network operator role. Um, so there'll be a separation there. Then the discos will no longer be retailing electricity their role is going to be limited to the line owners and we're going to have a new segment in the market, the retailers. And I'd also like to point out here that the new the NEPRA Act, the amended NEPRA Act actually mandates a retail market in Pakistan by 2023. So whether we're ready or not, or like it or not, there will be a market in Pakistan and a wholesale market by the year 2023, according to the amended NEPRA Act. But the point is these, these issues arise anywhere where there is a transition from an older system to a newer system, a country like ours with limited resources or, or an advanced country with advanced markets and you know, a better economy than ours. So that's something that we already know and so we can prepare for in advance. And CPPAG to some extent is already doing that. The problems that are arising Particularly, Shail Saab mentioned wheeling. Wheeling was supposed to be a transitory phase between our current single buyer plus model and the wholesale market. We were supposed to have this intermediate bilateral trading um, system in place. Now, the reason why CPPAG is um, objecting to wheeling is because they are right now acting as a proxy for the Ministry of Energy. Uh, CPPAG itself, in its own role as market operator, should have no issues with it's in their name. It's a part of their name. The problem is that they're representing the Ministry of Energy. What is the Ministry of Energy's issue with wheeling? The capacity payments. Wheeling has the potential to exacerbate the capacity payment problem that we're facing and the circular debt issue, which is why it's become so contentious and there are so many entities opposing it at the moment. So 
what I'm trying to say is that everything is interconnected. The markets are connected to the way we're running our system currently. The markets are connected. The future of our electricity market is connected to our circular debt issue. We okay. are essentially uh, um, stalling the market transformation because we haven't found a solution to what we discussed in our first webinar, a circular debt issue. So the minute the government either takes on of the capacity payments and takes it out of the equation or comes up with some other formula to address it, this whole problem will go away and we'll have a wheeling market in Pakistan tomorrow. I would also like to point out, someone mentioned, I wasn't sure, who, I'm not sure which was, that there are no takers or buyers for wheeling power or, and even sellers for wheeling power. You'll be surprised to hear that there is almost a gigawatt of uh, planned wheeling power projects, solar power projects that are ready to get off the ground the day schools mm. start signing wheeling contracts. Mm. So there is huge mm. pent up demand and supply, at least yes. in solar, wheeled solar power, that segment mm. of the mm. um, But the issue is that the powers that be are opposing it and in their minds, for good reason. I mean, what do we do? This the circular debt issue could mm become an even bigger monster if, you know, several gigawatts of power is suddenly weaned across Pakistan's network. Um, so these things have to be sorted out. All the issues lead into the market model that we're trying to implement in Pakistan. All the issues that you've discussed up to this day. And so unless that, that backlog of issues is dealt with, uh, moving to the next phase of our power story is going to be difficult. Uh, or more difficult than it needs to be. It's going to be a difficult period, but it'll be more difficult than it needs to be. Good point. Very good point. Oh, you, but the, you can't have unhealthy players in a market. Unfortunately, that's a problem. And if you've got a market that's totally unhealthy, there is going to be an issue. Uh, Akhtar Saab, would you like to say something? Yes, sir. <coughs> sir, <coughs> there is something called the big, big market, the market that exists in the advanced countries about which you are talking about. But there is a very elemental form of competition which is allowed by our existing policies, frameworks, and we do not practice them. We are scared of competition. Hmm. There was a Jamsoro coal power plant which showed the dirty linen, which showed that the other projects that have been implemented were implemented at a, at a cost which was 40% higher. The current power policy provides for something what you call solicited projects in their technical, which simply means that you invite whatever be the project, you invite competition for that, for its capex. What complications are there? I, I don't really understand 50,000 megawatt of power has been committed and no competition has been held till now. So if we want competition can be started at least uh, at the capex level of the power plants. Every buyer, whether he is of electricity or any other commodity wants to find out from potential sellers what would be the price. So, you know, there has been a, a scare among the policymakers and stakeholders regarding competition. So one thing is certain, but of course, 50,000 megawatt has been committed for the IGCP, there is 75,000 megawatt. So only 25,000 megawatt might slot might be available for competitive bidding, if at all that capacity comes is bidded for, because the demand is going slow, it is possible that uh, the market may be lim limited till uh, 50,000 megawatt. Secondly, you cannot have a, a burgeoning market in the beginning. You can bring in a lot of players in it through special measures, like one which Armina talked about, the solar uh, power can be brought into the market. 
market, you can allow. You see, the biggest issue is the power purchase agreements. They are tight. There are no free actors available. Whatever capacity is there, it is committed in the form of a power purchase agreement. So what you can do is, after some studies, of course, that you allow a certain portion of the committed capacity to be floated in the market. So that is another way you can deepen. Capac uh, captive power is already available. You can have mm -hmm. a, you can begin with a, uh, what you call voluntary, voluntary market exchange as it is there in India. You start learning, learning the initial steps through a voluntary market. In India, about 2% uh, of electricity is being traded in that uh, market. It is playing a role. It is telling them, uh, teaching them how uh, market operates. It does indicate uh, what is the uh, going rate of uh, uh, marginal costs. So third is, there are problems in the model that has been prepared by CPPAG. There are two basic models in the markets. One is the cost-based model and the other is bid-based model. Yeah. They have taken cost-based model, uh, which to my mind would not create a lot of competition. Cost-based model is something that we already have. We already have this uh, variable costs and what you call uh, uh, I'm, no, I'm not remembering the, the exact technical name. So we have in a way, what, in cost-based models, what is done is that the system operator determines the price. In our case, NEPRA is available, which determines the price. So what the heck? If CTBM is implemented, NEPRA would be uh, providing the uh, the costs. So uh, it is an issue whether you have a cost-based model or a bid-based model. This bid-based model are, for example, in Europe, where there is an open market exchange, there is a, a seller who comes with its price prices, and this through a algorithm they compute a, a marginal cost, marginal price, and there are buyers who place their bids. And the bids and the, uh, the the bids of the supplier and bids of the uh, uh, buyers are matched, and a, a, a cutting price is obtained. So that is one issue that has to be resolved in uh, the city BCM, which has been proposed. Secondly, uh, it they are actually uh, pursuing a beaten path. This uh, bilateral trading of DISCO, that is coming from a long time, old, older times. We have a, an established uh, system of uniform pricing. That system of uniform pricing, our economy is based on uniform pricing. I'm afraid that the CTBCM would uh, create regional markets uh, based on discos where the there would be different prices. So that is another. And secondly, discos are very weak inst institutions these days. CPPAG is much more organized, much more stronger, uh, professionally, economically, et cetera, et cetera. And it has a large, it has a large canvas. It can work out average costs, et cetera. While discos are in a transition stage, they have to be privatized, et cetera, et cetera. So why, why to transfer the business of managing the market from a viable institution, relatively stronger institution, to the institutions which are uh, uh, in a transition stage, which are weak, which are uh, doing losses, Etc. 
components of wheeling you cannot possibly implement a proper uh, what has hap- what happens is that an individual seller wants to applies for a uh, for a wheeling proposal and his case is examined in a period of 6 months uh, and etc and etc and and then a, t- a tariff is determined what we need is a, what we need is a kind of a readily implementable framework whereby uh, wheeling rates are decided in a week and if you have those eight components that i have uh, spoken about it would not be uh, really impossible to issue uh, wheeling rates uh, in a डिस्कशन When we speak about uh, electricity market, तो broadly हम दो categories की बात करते हैं. Centrally economic dispatch uh, market models that is mostly into the USA, and then we are second one is the self dispatch markets, self uh, market model that is the Europe. पहले वाले में ये जो city BCA में Just stay in English because there are some people who you don't know. I mean, the, uh, I mean the uh, the model. I'm I'm surprised to say it. That just uh, what we are telling it the competitive competitive trade trading and bilateral market. Basically, not there is a name, but there is no any kind of a competition into it. Like after sub said, we have already the generation 36 gigawatt installed and 15 gigawatt uh, <clears throat> committed. Once the the consumer price the consumer tariff to the tariff the 60 to 70% cost is from the generation and into the existing model there is a no wholesale electricity market created then if 65% of the cost is fixed then by the question readily comes into the mind a model having no competition if i feel this model is being to be cod by the number 2021 20, <clears throat> by 2025 or 2023 should i ask myself what was the purpose purpose was to create a efficiency and then competition and do away with the certain relief to the uh, consumer would it listen the current tariff is the 18 rupees per kilowatt hour would it be 16 15 or would it be 22 so i would say it would be 20 20 or it would rising the uh, it will rise the tariff because the cost centers are being to be created the current cppag would be split into the three more uh, uh, other organizations the mo market operator then you have the spt the special purpose trader that would be settling like dr saab said from today the companies are not willing to even not believing on the implementation agreement for with the cppag which is a piece of paper not a real instrument for the in cashment in that model all these generations are said to be commercially allocated to the discos then and second part in the bilateral contracting they are said to be to procure their future generation directly on country side we are believing into the central planning and we are talking about the uh, to how that would be creating an efficiency so it is it is rising the cost on the back part on the uh, bilateral market when you speak about the bilateral market the model that is being to be implemented is called single buyer plus regime mm. are we saying what we are being going to create the what is the new uh, nothing is new because from the since 2015 the wheeling was there means bilateral arrangement was there 
why the village is not taking off take and then there is no any project thanks to imran khan pahod has been said shay satar sahab is spoke about that is the pahod has been done with the special uh, favors and then terms that the first ever wheeling agreement which is executed with the exit and entry clause of the project that the love boy uh, uh, sahab uh, jaldi kar le ji ji now now what what wheeling has uh, on one side we are talking about the competitive market on other mm. side the discourse uh, has challenged the wheelings that they want that mm. the losses their losses has to be included yeah. into the wheeling charges the use Fair of point. system is a fair yeah, enough yeah. and then cs let's say like uh, uh, like uh, 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 i mean uh, uh, and then the standard cost of the banking the banking on the competitive market we say there would be no banking in competitive market there would be no banking like if i am a generator and there is an buyer and today my buyer is getting my 100 megawatt and tomorrow it is off and then i am i am available i am delivering to get i want my electric energy to be stored but now competitive market says its settlement would be based energy settlement would be based on the marginal cost whereas a wheeling uh, uh, says that it has to be a, a balancing uh, a banking concept discourse it should have to be a, a, a balancing concept with the but the most most failure is that when the discourse say when you do the wheeling uh, you will have to do it like uh, uh, the, uh, a system of the jaldi sahab jaldi kar le people are uh, getting anxious sir bas so, i think okay, and no? the last 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 one man mm-hmm. and then the the wo- most strange thing that the discourse are wheeling that the, if we do the wheeling the mm-hmm. the buyer and seller of the wheel the system operator uh, operator should be given the right of economic dispatch come on what is this once you are in the central dispatch now to the, it cannot be willing to what two buyer no, no, and seller no, no. agreed so uh, so you cannot put into a economic dispatch and all together the so competition is not being to be created into the current one and how you can how we okay. how we i'm finishing i'm finishing just uh, how no. we can uh, how no. we can expect ke city bism can be implemented whereas grid code cannot accommodate today's grid code cannot okay. accommodate provincial grid established no hvdc cannot be operated according to the current grid code and commercial code the commercial code does not have the mo and spt operations okay bhutta sahab bhutta sahab i have to cut you off now sorry yeah, okay. both lamba um, there was somebody from ntdc who wanted to speak but i think he's left in frustration i would are you there gentleman from ntdc I don't think so. Okay, Tahir Dinsa Sahab, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, finally. I will take. Okay, yeah. Okay, finally, thank you. I will take only ninety seconds. I'll not speak for a very long time. Good. Actually, the Will Durant has said that the first lesson we learn from history is that we don't learn from the history. i personally think that pull is not going to work here we need a push and what i'm saying is when you nail and to drive a nail in something you apply a very large force for a very short time and when you want to pull the nail back out you apply a small force for a very long time when you apply a small force for a very long time that is the period when you negotiate In 1994, in 1998, when Nader Parvez was doing all that uh, negotiations, I would quickly quote two examples from the history and then stop. There was a gentleman lawyer, Afridi, who was taken from the uh, New York, young lad, young boy, and brought here. And IPPs established his uh, on set up here in, in a plaza. and he was the lawyer of the ipps and the reason was that his father was the ar- judge of the arbitration court of the paris chamber of commerce when a guarantee of an ipp was called 30 million dollars government of pakistan knew that you it is not one lump it is 1 million 1 million 1 million and you have to run around and that failed because first they apply a short force and then second when uh, you know uh, <laughs> the 90 second khatam ho gaye so okay. i think this arbitration it is a sovereign thing you need to do that and uh, that is how you going to build the cash theek hai thank you acha ji i'll go back to the panel now there's no other hands so we'll go back to the panel aisha bibi i'll give you the first crack whatever you want to say my view is we've got ourselves into a huge mess 
Armina is absolutely right. Armina, I also want to come back to you because I noticed you said CPPA has done a lot of work. So I went to the CPPA website and I looked up. They have two or three documents there. Yes, they have documents there. But Armina, they're all prepared by the Asian Development Bank, which is probably the reason why CPPA doesn't want to talk because I don't think they understand those documents. So, no, so I, G, Go idea. ahead, sorry to cut you. Go ahead, I'm, go ahead. Ahead. I think you're being very I'm unfair. I'm... There are very qualified people who know G. the thing in G. CBPA very well. I think this is very unfair to them. G. And I'm I talking engineers, right. economists, financial analysts, etc. A whole range of expertise who are very qualified, very competent, and it's unfair. Rashid Sab, Rashid Sab, let me come back a little, please. I am looking at their website right now. Actually, let me share the screen with you, okay? We'll share the screen. Because quite frankly, I think we have these myths roaming around as if there's a lot of work being done. Here is their website, right? This is what we have. Brief notes on the electricity market, okay? I just downloaded it. In fact, I downloaded it before, right? Okay, take a look. I mean, I can only go by evidence. You tell me to go by evidence. And then you don't want evidence. Here. Yeah. Um, right? Nadeem the Saab. Next, if I can just... Wait a minute, Amina Bibi. Clarify, Karne. I'm not making any false charges. I'm just saying I've gone through all four documents. There are only four documents here. I can only... You can't... Rashid Saab, you can't keep changing your approach. Sometimes when we say something, you say, I need evidence. I'm giving you evidence. Where is the report? I look for evidence. P PID is doing its own work, putting it out. If I see donor reports, I don't see own work. Go ahead, Armina Bibi. Gee, I was just going to say it's the way that they these these organization work organizations work. Unfortunately, they're very reliant on outside support for capacity okay. building, quote unquote. Okay. So okay. ADB gave them uh, the resources, money and otherwise, to help with this uh, market building, okay. uh, you know, initiative. Um, briefly, very briefly, Rashid Saab and myself, we interacted with that team, uh, with the ADB team or the, the consultants that were hired by them and the CPPAG team. And I guess our point of view comes from that experience. Uh, CPPAG was completely raw or their current team was completely raw when they took them on. But two years later or three years later, you could see the transformation that came about and the capacity that they had inculcated within the organization. Okay. So there are some good people there. and. Unfortunately, maybe all the output is not on the website to see. But so can, we do can you please that. convey to them that the people of Pakistan would like to see some output from our own people? We Gee. don't all, we are not, we are sitting in 2020. We don't Gee. want Gustav Papanek to be ruling us today and giving us donor reports. Where is our own agency's work? I'd like to see that. I mean, the, the sort of uh, logic behind doing it this way is that there is no need to reinvent the wheel. So the strategy they adopted was to go around and study the international markets and then figure out the best model for Pakistan. So these reports that you see are mostly on that international experience. Um, and then why? I, I just mentioned that this thing about not reinventing the wheel, I find that very, very remiss because unfortunately, we need to invent the wheel in this country. There is no wheel in this country. We don't have it yet. So if you're going to get the Asian Development Bank to re reinvent the wheel, this is what we did with the World Bank in 94 and why we are sitting in a mess. I think it's time we started taking responsibility. This is why we are holding these webinars. It's not Asian Development Bank. We asked them to come and conduct their, present their report here. They refuse to do that. They don't even want peer review. So let's be clear what we want to achieve. And I think part of the problem is we are not clear at all. Now I got the NTTC guy again. Let me take him on. Shahid Sab, batayye, please. Shahid Abbas Sab. Shahid Abbas Sab. Are you there? Sir, I, uh, may I say that I would Shahid like Abbas to... Shahid Abbas Sab, kind of... Jee, Jee. As alaikum, sir. First of all, thank you very much, sir, for giving me opportunity to ask question from ex <coughs> expert of power sector. Mm -hmm. Sir, my first consumption of electricity is fixed around 120 terawatt hour from last two to three years. Mm -hmm. My question is how CTBCM will reduce cost of electricity through competition? when demand is fixed. 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ वी इंक्रीज डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन कंपनी फ्रॉम टेन टू ट्वेंटी हाउ डिस्कोर्स और हाउ कंपिटिशन विल रेड्यूस कॉस्ट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिसिटी माई सेकेंड क्वेश्चन इज पाकिस्तान इज कंज्यूमिंग फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ टोटल इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इन डोमेस्टिक और रेजिडेंशियल सेक्टर वेर एज चाइना इज कंज्यूमिंग जस्ट सिक्सटीन परसेंट एंड इंडिया इज कंज्यूमिंग ओनली ट्वेंटी फोर परसेंट ऑफ टोटल इलेक्ट्रिसिटी इन डोमेस्टिक सेक्टर नो माई क्वेश्चन इज हाउ सी टी बी सी एम कैन प्लान हाउ टू शिफ्ट द फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिसिटी डेट इज यूज इन डोमेस्टिक सेक्टर यू कैन से इलेक्ट्रिसिटी हाउ सी पी पी ए जी और सी पी पी एम कैन शिफ्ट द कंजम्पन इलेक्ट्रिसिटी फ्राम डोमेस्टिकोमी थैंक यू सर थैंक यू जी थैंक यू अच्छा जी चलिए लेट्स गो टू आयशा बीबी आयशा बीबी गो हेड क्लास नदीम इफ यू गिव मी आई वांट टू स्पीक बोलिए बोलिए बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हियर इज द रिपोर्ट फॉर अ चेंज यू हैव ओपन द वन ऑफ द एडीबीज डॉक्यूमेंट्स आई डोंट डिनाई इट दैट दैट इज द स्टार्टिंग पॉइंट एंड आई डोंट आल्सो वांट टू होल्ड बैक फ्रॉम सीपीपीए स्टाफ स्पेंड्स अ लॉट ऑफ टाइम वर्किंग विद द इंटरनेशनल कंसल्टेंट्स has acquired a lot of the knowledge that those consultants have <clears throat> incidentally their experience was first in spain etc etc but the cppa staff have customized and have developed a lot of expertise in customizing the turkey model the ctbcm to pakistan i don't want to deny it it starts with there is an adb project document but ultimately there is a cppa document which is submitted to nepra There is a CPPA document Raji, which is submitted to. Can you? Can I? Can I please? Huh? May I? May I just suggest this, Rashid Sahab? Let's have CPPA come here and talk to us, and we'll have this discussion. Right now, I think I take your point. I'm not taking away from it. I'm not accusing CPPA. All I'm saying is I want to see stuff on the website. and stuff by our own people and not by ADB. I started life, Rashid Sahab, like you, forty years ago. and we were doing capacity building and the same thing was happening here the world bank is coming in this is coming in and 40 years later we've got the same thing going on how long will this go on another 40 years 50 years when are we going to start developing our own plans so may i speak so my Rashid. answer to that is we were a 12000 megawatt system then and we are a 25000 that's the development okay between okay. those 40 years the system has tripled the gas system has in fact gone gone five times the capacity of the time when you and you are talking of it used to transmit 850 million cubic feet a day today it's transmitting 4000 plus so those are what are the developments yeah fair enough but but reflected by population it per capita probably we are still at the same place go ahead shahid saab sir uh, the thing is i beg to again forgiveness from dr rashid dubey and armina but the thing is that the ctbtm and whatever cppa has been up to has not been held up to scrutiny by the rest of the country by the stakeholders and i'm sorry uh, the influence or the overall impact of the adb consultants has been pervasive and uh, Uh, this is my impression i may be wrong but this is quite the fact uh, however uh, again i mean is it the right model is it the wrong model i mean where has been the where is the debate i don't see any and i have not i've i've been part of this sector for a long time i have yet to come across any document which discusses this so uh, i am i i'm really confused as to how you know this thing has been developed in under in closed doors and so forth and submitted to nepra and they call a public hearing so called and uh, that is enough that's not thank you okay ji aisha bibi go ahead your last final sort of thoughts and comments ji yeah. aisha Sorry. Uh, sorry yeah sorry about that um so i think that uh, uh, you know both armina and shahid uh, rashid saab and you know the other side have made uh, valid points about you know how cppa uh, how this thing has come about and you know the, the transitional issues you know what kind of model we would have 
uh, how do we take the stakeholder input and and uh, you know how that's uh, proceeded um so yes i mean we know that they are following a somewhat stated process so they they have uh, once they develop the plan i think that goes to nepra in fact the hearings the nepra hearings are there along with the plan itself and i i believe i have seen it you know at least a few months back the initial plan so so at least that is available but you're right that it requires broader consultation in fact you know and that is the reason why um, you know this thing Uh, has been delayed you know the decision was taken in 2015 at, at that time we uh, the document stated we'll have a cbt cm market or a wholesale market by 2020 and you know it never materialized and our mina is saying that there's a retail market uh, plan for 2023 and so it keeps on getting pushed because there's no leadership uh, from the political side and there's not enough discussion or you know consensus from the political side from our government that this needs to happen or you know what are the pros and cons or if we are to go for it you know how would we do it and so you know all that happens is you know adb behind closed doors you know uh, uh, along with the consultants uh, helping cppa make this plan and cppa taking it to nepra following whatever the stated process is but that you know then never gets out into public discourse and you know then there are all kinds of contradicting voices um you know when uh the document finally gets to the high level decision making authorities which then ends up delaying uh you know the decision making processes uh further so mm-hmm. so so that's you know the reality of how things have pro- pro- uh, progressed and you know why things have stalled um in terms of you know uh, you know what cbba has done how much capacity it has uh now i think it has uh embarked on the process in fact it has two capacity building programs not just with adb it has one with lams it has one with nast as well and that program has been going on for about a year and a half in which you know different cppa members as well as ntdc members as well as disco members come and you know they are taking part in uh, trainings which have to do not just with you know the engineering side of it but also the management the economics and the legal side of of uh, this uh, transitioning to markets and that program is called the electricity markets professionals program so i mean not to doubt their intentions or their effort uh, you know is it sufficient or not i think you know there is uh, you know inadequacy on the side of the government as well our uh, you know uh, political decision making processes and you know that basically remains uh, you know one of the hurdles uh, in uh, for us to transition you know in a fair or transparent manner uh, towards uh, you know any of these models mm-hmm. thank you aisha bibi thank you um uh, amir durani so thank you very much i think sir just to sum up today's discussion and i think it's important that we understand that this is the game of lenses and at the core of the game of lenses what i mean by lenses everyone is wearing their own lens you have the bond markets lens i have the distributed generation lens because i look at uh, i roam around pakistan and probably see more of the the real outdoor pakistan then so i carry that lens because i see underserved unserved etc i think shahid has the has the industry lens but also i think he has a much wider jima saab obviously has an inside lens uh, which comes with you know certain realizations which one sees out but i think that you know uh, let me t- i want to answer this question about capacity because i think it's important that we keep fighting at each other about the fact that you know whenever we say oh no no we have a lot of capacity so i think nadeem sir you rashid sir or myself i mean aap log mere se zyada you've been around longer in these institutions but i know that when i had to push 500 million dollars down the throat of any country i had to be kind of semi patronizing right i mean i had to go back there and actually the only way my board would buy uh, a, a loan to whatever like let's say the in kazakhstan you know competing with ebrd i'd have to push down half a billion so i'd say well you know there is hope they have achieved this much and blah blah so when i heard i mean hearing ourselves speak about the capacity there is no resident capacity in pakistan i have to please beg you to realize that the only capacity we have i mean i'm on the corporate advisory council co chair in nast for the energy i'm also have uh, baby sat kasan i think everybody knows that uh, i'm also on the board of bio energy with nast what do these professionals do when they come there let me tell you honestly they are there to try and do one of two things if they are aged they want to get their children out into the right universities the second is their learning is perfunctory they want to go on a next course 
I'm I'm being very straightforward as a human being. I think sometimes it's important for us to understand that what is thwarting the debate is that the debate is not being allowed to take place in the right place. Right. That is what I think uh, Ermina is, uh, and uh, Rasha Saab would like to say this debate. And I think that's what you want to say. Let's have this debate at the place where it can make a difference, because otherwise, you know, we can keep talking about this and people, you know, the donors will keep coming by and they'll be patronizing because they need to score money. That's their performance benchmark. Let me give you two examples from the energy sector today. These models, the, when we talk of CTBCM, if you visualize CTBCM, it will not work if one of your generator is 1,400 kilometers away. CTBCM will work when you have almost a mimicry or a mimicking of a localized generation setup with a localized distribution setup. I mean, that there is no wonder that when Germany decentralized, that four, including one of their NTDCs, are now own 76% of the grid. But that grid is not going helter-skelter. It's in an area. It's like, you know, Punjab has an area. The north will be an area. What's wrong with that? You know, we cannot even agree on different energy prices across Pakistan. Why is that? Right? So, sir, I think the debate, you know, this is very good. But, I mean, my, my closing remarks is, Please, let's all not lose hope. I would like to talk more about this because if we don't, then the future is at risk. And I think we need to bring the government more and more and more into this and stop telling us as a government, our government wears nice shirts. They are very intelligent. But do they think about Pakistan? No, they don't. Thank you. Shahid Sattar, any last words? Uh, if I may, sir. Uh, the, first of all, uh, Akhtar Ali Saab made some very valid comments. And... Uh, the, but the basic issue, as far as I am aware, is that the, if the market is allowed to work, it will reduce the price. But we, uh, and the market is not being allowed to work by the very government that is trying to say that it is going to make the market work. And uh, CPPA is just the front face of the government. Um, and as such, um, the without breaking the next the political economy of the power sector we can't move forward so and uh, my firm belief is that uh, irrespective of whatever models whatever uh, dealing whatever we try to do nothing will work in pakistan unless we break this nexus first kima saab you wanted to say something uh, uh, just half a minute sir you go ahead i go just ahead. wanted to give some information sum it up that... as much as can ji so India, India started with the whole process in 2004 when they allowed open access. Mm -hmm. That is, in other words, wheeling. They allowed it. And in 2006, they set up the wholesale market, which was firmed up in 2008. And by now, anything between 6 to 8% of the power is marketed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has taken so many years, six, uh, 16 years, and still everything is in a limbo still in the process but at least they are on it so the best thing is for pakistan to provide open access to the buyers and sellers i am happy to know that armina saiba says that that there are thousands so let's allow them to operate this is the first thing which needs to be done and I'll then differ a little bit with uh, my friend Shahid Sattar when he says that the CPPAG is the, is the mouthpiece of the government. No, it is not the mouthpiece of the government. It isn't that big. It is just the mouthpiece of the power divin, and that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ji. Thank you, folks. I think we've had a very good webinar again. Ahmed Durani, you're absolutely right. We come at each other with our lenses. And yes, of course, we want to continue the dialogue primarily because, quite frankly, this dialogue should, NEPRA and uh, CPP, everybody should come into the dialogue. And this dialogue should have been held many years ago. And we should continue to hold it because this is the only way to do business. Hiding in rooms is not going to do it. Secondly, when you say we have so many lenses, yes, of course, setting up a market is a very complex thing. You can't do it on an ADB report and you can't do it. Otherwise, we would have had many things. As I said, I have worked on setting up many markets and despite many very well written technical reports that we left behind, the markets still have not taken off. We know the markets haven't taken off because you need local champions, you need local people to make the market. Unless local people are doing it, 
technical assistance. I just did it in Africa recently. And you know, yeah, you go and leave a report. It's easy to do. I can write it in a, overnight in a, in a hotel and I can do it. But I used to tell my colleagues there that I know you're not interested. So this is the report. I've written it for my bosses, not for anybody else. So the question is, anybody taking leadership here, are we owning these markets? Are we thinking it through? And please, let's forget it. It's not reinventing the wheel. Setting up a market is a hugely complex task. Many people have won the Nobel Prize for it, and we still don't know how to set up a market. I won't say we know it. It's a complex task that has to evolve a market. And let's get cerebral about it. Let's not think that it's just one ADB report that will do it. Thank you, folks. I appreciate taking off your time, all the uh, round table. I'm very thankful to you. Inshallah, we'll have another one very soon. Thank you. All the best, folks. Thank Any you. ideas, Thank please you. tell me. Thank you. Bye-bye.